so, so I'm here talking about Buffalo with Corey Wallen, um, <laughs> who is our internal events coordinator. Mm -hmm. uh, and I'm talking about Buffalo with him because he just came to us relatively recently from Buffalo. So welcome to Toledo, Corey. Thank you. you so happy to be here. We're thrilled to have you. You started in January. Yes. Just in time <laughs> for a good six, six weeks or so before we started getting nervous about COVID. Correct. And then two months before we uh, ended up closing for 99 days. Yep. Yeah. So what's that been like, right? That's sort of an interesting time to start. Talk a little bit about your transition into your role against this unprecedented backdrop. Yeah, so, um, I mean, I came again in, in January, so you're kind of picking up into like the season of, of event coordinating because people tend to start to do things more inside. Um, I spent a few, um, I, fe I spent a few months just kind of getting getting myself acclimated to the position as far as like listening and asking questions and kind of finding out what the cadence of the institution is actually moving towards. Um, so that's relatively difficult to do in a very short amount of time before then, because um, I'm very interpersonal. I really like those face-to-face -face conversations. So, you know, when you're transitioning into a platform where you have to take on more of a remote access um, in order to receive information from people, it kind of, um, it kind of makes it a little bit more of a challenge. Um, so the industry that I'm in, in relation to COVID was like completely decimated. Um, so now just moving and looking forward to the future, it kind of gives a much greater um, opportunity to explore new creative and innovation, innovative ways um, to like target different audiences because everyone's been affected by it. And so whatever the public's perception is, um, you want to be able to uh, pre-package pre some type of, of an event that they feel comfortable doing. So before we get to you know a couple follow-ups to that question, first, why don't you just level set with our audience and tell everyone what, it, what is an internal events coordinator do? Sure, so um, it has a lot of similarities. Like, like when I think of event coordinating, for me, it coincides more with how are we making memories for people that are attending this event. Again, I think oftentimes just the word event makes it sound like it has to be more grandeur than it actually is. So oftentimes it's just like coordinating or orchestrating a function. And so it's the event that it's the people that are attending it. Or it's, it's essentially what they're coming away from is mm. feeling like it was an event that they are proud to have attended. Mm. Right? So as opposed to an external event coordinator, the majority of my clients are the people that I work with are within the confines of the museum or other internal organizations or different departments that are sometimes um, predetermining the program. Um, then we also have another branch of my, um, you know, of my subset, which are different programs that we do in-house. For example, Wine by the Glass. Mm -hmm. um, there's another program that we're trying to get off the ground right now called Curate where we put parentheses around the ATE, so you're kind of bridging between art and food, so you're getting a taste for art. Right. Um, so that's something that we're trying to undertake and incorporating more of like community resources and breweries and distilleries and restaurants. So um, not only are we leveraging the TMA brand as a platform to host these functions, but you're also bringing in audiences from different organizations who are oftentimes presenting their craft, their creativity. Right. Um, so this is just something that I've long put some thought and time into because, um, again, one component of like leveraging TMA's brand is this whole notion of visual literacy. And so I'm big into like modern contemporary cuisine, so I talk about food the same way you would talk about art. Mm -hmm. So your depths, your textures, your compositions, your colors, your um, you know contrasting values. Um, and so as an internal event coordinator, I very much look at how we can take what makes TMA special 
and provide it to the people that are hosting their function here. Yeah, it's, it, it's interesting, you know, drawing these connections. We were just talking with um, uh, Maria um, mm -hmm. from Education and with Sean and Woody from the Boys and Girls Club. We're talking about the Art of the Cut program. Mm -hmm. And really, in some ways, there's this notion that what the Toledo Museum of Art is doing is it's expanding its arts educational program. Mm -hmm. Um, to a broader subset of activities that engage yeah. right artistry mm -hmm. uh, and also leveraging our role as anchor institution mm -hmm. in your case to support and give visibility to other local artists and artisans although their craft is beverage food etc right um, uh, and or right in the case of the art of the cut barbers yeah um, and there's really an interesting model there right about how we can leverage what it is which is core to TMA mm -hmm. right but do so in a way which is sort of broader and more accessible maybe in the first instance yeah I mean we work here at TMA but when you look at the roles of museums in the 21st century oftentimes the type of feeling that you give person resides outside of the confines of the wall itself. Um, so it's like looking at different opportunities in which you can take the platform in which we represent and give it to the community in ways that they feel more comfortable accepting it. So on a micro scale, when I talk about beverage, food, and drink, that's something that everyone um, exercises and it's something that everyone does well even more to the point you know so there's a, a marketing firm in new york i'm sure you're familiar with culture track which is a survey mm -hmm. which has done a statistically significant sample of the united states done every three years by a firm called the plaka cohen um and uh Eating at a restaurant mm -hmm. is considered now in the 21st century a cultural experience. Absolutely, um, that you know, cult, big C culture has been replaced by little C culture, and it's actually a good thing, right? Mm -hmm. It broadens the scope of opportunities to engage people with our institution. Yeah. So I want I want to I want to transition a bit to your sure. background, right? So you come to us from Buffalo. We were talking about mm -hmm. that. Um, you were at the Albright Knox previously, correct? Right, a building that was designed by the same architect. Uh, yep, Edward Green. So, tell how long were you in Buffalo for? How long were you at the Albright Knox for? I should say. I was at the Albright Knox for five years. And what did you do there? I was. I did a lot of things there. <laughs> um, so, my my formal title was assistant restaurant and catering manager. Mm -hmm. um, but as you very well know, we were undergoing a very large capital campaign. So. I was also a uh, like private chef in residence at the director's house for when we hosted dinners there. Okay. Um, in the time of working at the museum, I also um, took my introductory course for sommelier, so I'm, I like wine. It's a very interesting uh, topic. The only person who gets to drink on the job at the museum. Corey. <laughs> yeah, yeah. <laughs> yeah, we got that on camera. <laughs> um, but so I, I did that and then we had, again, as an internal event coordinator here, you're working with departments internally or within the organization. So there were after hours programs that I would oversee. There were um, uh, members receptions. Um, one of the differences between this institution and the Albright Knox is you have to pay an admission in here. Mm -hmm. So when you're hosting a function at TMA, I think I think it it make more sense to invite the people that you want to come here as opposed to just having an open invitation for anyone to come if sure. that makes sense. So it's not about making something exclusive. It's about or excuse me. Yeah, it's not about making it exclusive. It's about giving someone the opportunity to to come to something they're actually being invited to. So it's like here's your party invitation we want you to come. So this aligns again with an earlier conversation and the invitation to attend mm -hmm. is one of the most important things to causing someone to feel welcome in the first instance. Yeah. And if we think about it, most people who are comfortable in museums are comfortable because they were fortunate enough to have had some good experience, mm -hmm. whether it was through an after school program early in their life or more usually through parents or teachers. Yep. But if you are not familiar with or comfortable in a museum to begin with, that yeah. invitation can overcome an awful lot. So wave your magic wand. You've been here for five years, let's say. Five years from now, what do internal events look like? What are some of the things that our viewers can look forward to seeing implemented in the, the coming years? Yeah, that's a, that's a really good question. I guess I hadn't put too much thought into it. You know, it's kind of... Um, yeah, I mean it's 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 
it doesn't, like I said, it's, it's kind of utilizing the missions and the values of the Toledo Museum of Art, but then creating an environment where people can have fun and engaging experiences that they can take back with them in hopes of looking at the calendar and saying, oh, here's a program that I had a good time at, let me go ahead and mark my calendar because I know my expectation is going to be met because of the fun time that I had previously. So it's just making events and programs like that much more accessible mm -hmm. in the sense that people are just looking forward to it and they're not just one-offs. So you mentioned Curate, so talk a little bit about what that program, you, you mentioned very briefly, but talk a little bit more detail about what that program might look like. Yeah, well we're still in the, in the brainstorming um, phase of, of this program and we're trying to turn it into something a little bit more of, of an umbrella term that incorporates different programs that coincides with again bridging the gap between um, between the, the, the notion of art and then, uh, and then food and beverage. So again, the visual literacy, you know, you talk about it the same way, but one of the programs with Curate would be to give a chef a walkthrough of a current exhibition and then they derive inspiration from the works in our collection to create a series of small bites and then there's a little bit more of an educational presentation talking about, again, what are the similarities, what are the differences, because, you know, if you, like one of the terms that I like to talk about as far as food is like, um, you know, palate cleansers, right? So what's nice about restaurants and cafes in museums is it provides a visual palate cleanser. Mm -hmm. Because if you, if you eat the same taste time and time again, your palate just becomes um, uh, un unenthused, so you don't really taste it as much. Mm -hmm. So you always have to incorporate a different component, whether it's a, a crunch component, to something that's a little bit uh, softer, like a panna cotta or something like that. <laughs> I know it's hard to follow, but it, it's like, it's in the same way, if you look at multiple paintings, mm -hmm. it's like eventually you need a space or a window to look out to per allow your brain to kind of reset before you take in more well, information. Well, certainly as we think about installing exhibitions, we think a lot about creating the sense of variety right mm -hmm. in the experience. And in fact, I think there's a musical term that fits well with this, which is staccato, mm -hmm. right? So there's a, there's a sense to the pacing and to the experience where you want to create enough difference yeah. that your intention, that you're consistently engaged. Well, so as you, as you continue to work through, and obviously you're new in your tenure, but as you continue to work through, um, you know, what internal events at the museum will look like over the long term, you mentioned, um, and this is a consistent theme, and it's mm -hmm. part of, you know, what, uh, you know, what we're doing here, um, uh, for me, right, is that listening is really important when you're starting out. So you've been listening and you've been learning. Tell me some of the things you've heard, right? So you're, um, you have this unbelievable point of view at, this, at the moment, right? You're enough of an insider that you've got it, but you're still enough of an outsider that you can look from sort of 10,000 feet. So what are your observations yeah. of the Toledo Museum of Art thus far? What are you hearing about its culture and its values? Um, again, I think one of the greatest values it has here is, is education in oftentimes the form of like malleability. So whether or not you're taking a class or you are um, you know, in the glass blowing studio. Um, so there's there's a lot of different activities that kind of coincide with that. Um, but oftentimes I find like there's, there's just a lot of conversation. Mm -hmm. And it would, it would be nice to, to find the common ground and then put it on the calendar and like work towards it. Um, so say more about that specifically. Be more specific about what the conversation about what. Well, it's just, it's just implementing new ideas and oftentimes when, you know, uh, a new employee comes to a new institution, they bring the new ideas, but then you have the, um, you kind of have the, we've kind of d done it this way right, for some time. And so oftentimes it's like, how do we get through the conversation? to be able to say, okay, like we're on board with what a new idea is. Well, it's certainly one of the things that I've been thinking a lot about is um, we are uh, in an unprecedented moment of history for all sorts of reasons. Um, uh, you know, uh, and when we first scheduled this interview, we thought it was because of a global pandemic. And of course, given the events of the past month, right, that has changed as well. The world is shifting beneath our feet. 
And as we think about how we can be responsive to the to these competing realities, um, it's essential that we think innovatively, mm -hmm. right? And innovation doesn't necessarily mean disruptive and technology based. It just means thinking differently about how we can use this platform as you described it to serve this community. I also, I also, if you don't mind no, me please. adding, um, sometimes I often have this problem and it's like trying to over intellectualize something that should be felt more emotionally. Um, and so when we kind of turn to like always asking the why instead of asking the how or incorporating uh, a person that can kind of offer us a new perspective into an idea that we already have um, kind of pre-anchored. Um, it's always fascinating to me to, to kind of get in the round table um, and just ask, ask questions, but like with the, with the intention of, of like learning more from them. Of course, yeah. of course. Well, look, and it is incumbent on anyone new to listen and learn, right? For sure. However, it is also um, true that uh, we have done it this way um, cannot be a valid reason to maintain the status quo. There may be very many good reasons to maintain mm -hmm. the status quo, but we have always done it this way is not one of them. Uh, and creating an environment which is conducive to innovative thinking, but then also to operationalizing those insights, moving from why to how, mm -hmm. um, is a really important part of where I think the institution can go. So thanks for sharing those observations. Uh, so what's the thing about Toledo which has most surprised you? Which is most what? Surprised you. Which is most? I love the metro parks. Again, I mean, with social distancing, you don't really find yourself, you know, going to very many restaurants. And I've been finding new and creative ways of, you know, finding different um, just trails to the university, um, going out to Wildwood. Um, I think it's Oak Opening. I mean, yeah. I'll just like set a pin on my map and go to it. But um, I really love the parks. Um, I love nature. I love spending time with it. I love, you know, growing things in the garden that can be incorporated in food as well. So you're also talking about like sustainability mm -hmm. and different um, kind of concurrent ideas with that. So um, what, what lesson, what, based on everything you've learned in your first six months about Toledo and about the museum, what advice would you have for me as I come into my role uh, okay. and continue to think through the way this institution can best serve its community? What advice would you give me? I like to think about what role a museum plays in the 21st century, and I keep repeating back because um, you want to you want to bring the institution to the to the people, or bring bring it to their community. And a way in which I had seen that done successfully back in Buffalo is with like public art projects. Mm -hmm. So we're we're not we're not the client out in the community painting walls. We're the liaison getting the artists that live in the community to beautify it, not gentrify it, add something that they want to it, but kind of shepherd how that can be done. And so then you start to create this nexus of different artworks that are throughout the community where people are like, oh, like I live over by the Freedom Wall or I live over by the Betsy Cassania. And when you find pockets of community of different backgrounds and cultures, they can kind of add their history to it and take ownership over it that way. So let me ask uh, the same question in a, in a very different way. Um, you do, you could do what you do for any restaurant, any hospitality group, any hotel. Mm -hmm. Why do you choose to do it for museums? Museums are so dynamic and I really love the capability to work with different people from different backgrounds and different departments and I'm always you know, trying to educate myself better um, again, as dynamic as a museum is, I like the role museum restaurants and cafes play. Because now they're entering a space, people, our audiences are entering a space of conversation and creation and collaboration and all these different, uh, you know, instead of just like a cultural experience going to a restaurant, you want people to come out of the hallways into your restaurant and have a cup of coffee and like feel like it's an additive or a value-added benefit to the museum. So Danny Mayer out of the... Um, um, Untitled, the white name. Yeah, uh, he's a Union Square Hospitality yep. Group um, CEO. He talks about the difference between like hospitality and customer service. So people are in our hallways and they're experiencing the artwork and then they come down and they get a hospitable experience in the restaurant and it just kind of completes the circle of 
consumer intangible, something they can walk away with. So I was having a conversation uh, with a colleague and just as far as like my industry and restaurants and things like that, um, how do I frame this? Is um, it would it'd be nice to have artwork in the restaurant and perhaps not just historic photographs of the museum and the people who have come to it because it's, uh, it, it's a little bit ethnocentric. If, you ju if you're just seated in the restaurant and you look around at the pictures and the history that it's being represented as, mm -hmm. I think we could uh, make it a little bit more universal and something a little bit more welcoming to... And this, this was just, just a new observation. I think that's a great observation, right? And I think this is the other opportunity and sort of wrap up with this maybe. You know, we need to listen, we need to learn, but we also need to synthesize and we need to act. Mm -hmm. <laughs> um, yeah, right? So listening and learning yeah. can't be an impediment to actually making sure that we generate understanding and we act accordingly to use this platform, to broaden our audience, to create a greater sense of welcome, a greater sense of hospitality, a greater sense of belonging. And we will do that over the coming years and your role will be instrumental in doing so. So keep listening, keep learning, keep synthesizing and keep giving good advice. And it's like having the challenging conversations, like, you know, even even just talking about it where you feel your your palms getting sweaty or your, you know, physiological responses to having a conversation that you might not feel comfortable having, but it's like integral to understand the other in okay. relation to ourselves. Absolutely. Thank you, Corey. I appreciate it. Thanks Thank for the you. opportunity. Thank you. All right.